So what we're going to do is just, uh, it's just a short session of anything that you think were, uh, would contribute to the forum that might be of interest, a question if you'd like to pose to other people. Um, and we'll just, we'll do this for about, well, up to 30 minutes for as long as you can deal with it. Um, and uh, then what we're going to be doing is having a, a fairly uh, open and frank discussion session where what I'm actually going to do, I was thinking about this before, I was going to sort of make it Q&A, but I find that sometimes um, can be quite daunting for people, is I'm going to put you in groups um, of sort of four or five people to talk about um, uh, some things I'm going to give you to talk about, and then to basically, for about 20 minutes, and then to report back to the group on, um, on what your group came up with. So that puts a little bit more pressure. <laughs> uh, so um, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment, but we'll spend uh, just sort of 20 to 30 minutes now on lightning talk. So would you like to start? And if I can ask, uh, so what we'll do is we'll go um, yourself, and then, hold on, who was the second? You came second, yes. And you came third. Who was my fourth person? My fourth person was you, your fourth. No take backs. Yes, no take backs. And then someone <laughs> over here is five. Okay, and then if anyone else wants to, that'd be cool. So if I can ask, um, in the order that you've uh, just been delegated, if you could make sure you come up um, and be ready to go straight after the person just in front of you, that'd be good. Speak into the lectern and um, have fun. Um, I just want to talk about a uh, particular data set that I, uh, I worked I worked for the New Zealand Institute of Plant and Food Research um, in Christ, uh, Lincoln, just outside of Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, and um, I've, I was working on a uh, database called the New Zealand Food Composition Database. And... Um, they, the, the New Zealand Ministry of Health had been given, um, uh, had given us lots of money to f analyse foods and then put the nutritional information of, on um, on thousands of foods. So you can go and get the, you know, the food analysis of a tomato or a steak or whatever. And um, I saw all this data and thought. This should be available to everybody. So I harassed, um, I started harassing people and harassing some of the senior management of the institute. And they finally relented. And uh, now you can go to a website called foodcomposition.co.nz. And although you have to download it and um, go, th the way they want you to do it is download it in Windows and then tick a whole bunch of things saying that you're never ever going to do anything with the data ever but that's not <laughs> but that's just lawyers for you <laughs> uh, but uh, you can um, it's I think it's an all care no responsibility license is what they finally um, agreed to this, um, and uh, yeah you can uh, download it and uh, I can't remember the, the format but anyway It'll open up with uh, a Linux archive tool, <laughs> and you don't have to agree. But anyway, uh, the uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it is. It is. It gives you the full uh, data analysis of about two and a half thousand foods and about three hundred odd nutrients in each food, um, like thirty odd different sugars and about a hundred different fatty acids and all the rest of it. Uh, but uh, you can narrow it down to the stuff that actually means something to most people. Um, but yeah, it's a useful data set, which um, yeah, so we, we especially put it together for New Zealanders, but Aussies as well. Yeah. We eat tomatoes as well. Yeah, but the big the big thing about New Zealand is though its big problem is that it, it has no iodine in the soil and no selenium. And nobody else in the world cares about iodine or selenium, but New Zealand does. So that's one of the things we... Eh? WA's got the same selenium problem. Oh, OK. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, it's sort of... A, 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 different parts of the world care about different things. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Would you mind adding that to the um, wiki? Or tweeting it or sending it to me in the email or something? Oh. OK, right. Yeah. Yeah. Just so I can add it. I think, yeah, well, someone's tweeting it, that'll be cool. All right, uh, shall we, we'll clap people all at the end. Done. Hi, I, uh, my name's Peter Ingerson from Wallace Office. I, I 
Peter made the point this morning, WIA uh, don't really have a, um, a government commitment at, as yet to an open data policy, but I did just want to reassure that um, in the spatial data world, at least, the West Australia Land Information System or uh, Location Information System, I should say, or Wallace, as it's perhaps more generally known, have been practising um, an open data philosophy for probably 30 years. Uh, so we've been sharing and had an established community which does share and, and very much practices sharing and caring for spatial data. Um, and that was enabled via the SLIP environment Pierre alluded to in 2007. Uh, that's undergoing a major redevelopment and we'll, there'll be a new release of this SLIP environment based on the uh, Google's Map Engine interface, uh, hoping to go live sometime this year. And there was a, a scaled down and very public facing version of that uh, released in December, Keith, wasn't it? Yeah. Or Locate WA? Yeah. November. So that, that's, and if you haven't had a look at that and you're from WA, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that, which is like kwa.wa.gov.au. Yeah. Just, Just Google it, yeah, and, and you'll uh, find it. Can, yeah, yeah and, and again, and, and that's where the, the new slip environment, the spatial data environment is heading. And just to add to that, and we are developing um, policies, uh, open data policies in respect of the um, that's spatial data environment as well. So that's just a quick update. Fantastic. Thank you very much. My name's Paul Hamilton. I um, used to work in local government and uh, in IT, sysadmin, and it all, uh, there's a local government IT group that meets once a year um, in Coffs Harbour. So about 200, 250 IT managers meet there. And it always used to uh, amaze me that we're all sitting there, and I suppose this is the same for federal and state government and other agencies, that we're all sitting there trying to invent the wheel, um, you know, dealing with the same kind of policies and everything. And I was wondering, uh, I did a bit of an envelope um, calculation once, trying to calculate how much we spend on Microsoft software, you know, just say plain office, and it came up into the millions and millions of dollars, and it was just back of envelope, looking at my costs, and then from a small shire, and then calculating out across WA, uh, 144 shires, and then across Australia. So I was wondering why, this is perhaps more policy, I don't know, but uh, why a government agency couldn't set up like a master help desk or something, a bit, maybe a bit like what Victoria's done, I don't know, I haven't followed them for a while, but just why haven't we standardised on some sort of open source software or a range of open source software out there? So it was more a question to you people. Uh, to us people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or to anyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> First of all, Pierre, you need coffee and you need water. Oh my god, yeah, you've got to go for me. I'm really sorry, everyone, I've been really tired. Thank you so much. I need cake too. I got cake? Oh my god. <laughs> you get cake because you're awesome. Uh, mic range, okay. Um, sorry, I don't know who was asking. Okay, I think this one's probably a multifold question and the reason that local government hasn't adopted a range of open source solutions, it's because of a pipeline. So if I look at discovery to deployment, if I look at the discovery to deployment pipeline, first of all, you as a um, sector, as a cohort, may not know what's out there. Then you may not know how to use that software, you may not know how to support that software and you may not know how to deploy that software. If I'm going with a proprietary solution, as a marketer in a proprietary company, it's my job to make you discover my software. It's my job to shoehorn <laughs> my software to fit your problem as a solution. And it's my job to do things like readiness and my job to do things like um, after sales support to make sure that you're utilising that software. We don't necessarily have that ecosystem in open source, um, although that's changing over time. So I think it's about building that pipeline, the search, the discovery, the um, alignment between enterprise problem and enterprise solution, 
making sure that the holistic needs of the organisation are thought of. Everyone knows how to use Microsoft Word. Everyone knows how to use Excel. Going from Word to Excel to LibreOffice or to OpenOffice is slightly different. Going from Exchange to um, Thunderbird, going from IE <laughs> to Firefox, it's a slightly different experience. So as an open source industry, I think what we need to do is make sure that we're covering off on the pipeline. And I'll stop holding the microphone. No, no, that was great. Um. So there's a couple of other things. Uh, shifting a desktop operating, like sh shifting the desktop's hard, stupid hard. And in fact, if you want a good case, well, that's where I'm about to get to. Yeah, so, but even shifting office is hard. Um, so South Australian government a few years ago, and it's very much worth going and talking to the office of the CIO down there about this experience. I don't think it was documented anywhere yet, but, um, but they did like a huge um, uh, trial of a bunch of um, Linux operating systems um, for the desktop for government, which is very, very interesting. But it's hard. It's very, very hard to shift the desktop. Having said that, so, so my first point is about the shift to cloud services is going to enable a lot of this. Because when your um, business applications are not reliant upon the operating system or on other parts of that stack, then you, know, you can shift a, a, a lot of stuff. I mean, for instance, there are a lot of departments in the federal government yeah, I can say this, who were stuck on IE6 for a long time because there were contracts with a major vendor that I won't name um, where the major vendor, and it's not Microsoft, where the major vendor said, we will, um, our current contract with you is to support um, your um, major business application through IE6 and we won't support IE7 or IE8, I think they were up to by that stage, um, unless you pay us a whole lot more money. So, so, the, you know, so there are a lot of things to take into account. So as things more, move more into the, the cloud, I think that's going to um, create more opportunities. Um, but the second one is, um, particularly in federal government, but particularly for large tenders, um, a department can only choose from the tenders that are given to it. And if every single tender response comes back, um, and, and there is absolutely no you know, um, variety in the options that come back, then you can only choose from what you're given. Otherwise, you know, it's it's like you're. Otherwise, you're actually thwarting what is actually, a, you know, supposed to be a, a reasonable system. So um, it's important to note that you know people actually need to put forward tender um, responses. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot more ways for SMEs, for small businesses, to actually engage with government to do contracting now than they were. So there's still a lot of perspective that it's too hard to work with government, but that's changed a lot just in the last few years. And um, so a lot of the industry needs to, you know, needs, needs to engage more with government and with the opportunities that are available to it. We now have a, in federal government an SME IT advocate, who, Don Easter, whose entire job is to look at how to make it easier um, for SMEs to actually get government business. So that's a whole new thing that's only a couple of years running and a lot of changes have been made to some of the rules and procurement stuff around to make that easier. So there's a couple of aspects there, but the other one is also just about that, that like you say, just collaborating and figuring out how to make it, um, how to find ways to solve a problem once rather than many, many, many times. Shared services is one of those terms that's become a dirty word because of you know a couple of states have had some pretty major issues that have been widely reported. Um, but there's other states and territories who have done it very, very, very well. And that's never reported because no one likes a feel-good story. Yeah. So um, getting more, I, guess, I think, um, balance in the reporting around um, what can and can't work, I think, is very important. Now, we had children. Yes? So there's a couple of other things. Uh, shifting a desktop operating, like sh shifting the desktop's hard, stupid hard. And in fact, if you want a good case, well, that's where I'm about to get to. Yeah, so, but even shifting office is hard. Um, so South Australian government a few years ago, and it's very much worth going and talking to the office of the CIO down there about this experience. I don't think it was documented anywhere yet, but, um, but they did like a huge um, uh, trial of a bunch of um, Linux operating systems um, for the desktop for government, which is very, very interesting. But it's hard, it's very, very hard to shift the desktop. Having said that, so, so my first point is about the shift to cloud services is going to enable a lot of this. Because when your um, business applications are not reliant upon the operating system or on other parts of that stack, then you, know, you can shift a, a, a lot of stuff. I mean, for instance, there are a lot of departments in the federal government. 
Yeah, I can say this. Who were stuck on IE6 for a long time because there were contracts with a major vendor that I won't name um, where the major vendor, and it's not Microsoft, where the major vendor said, we will, um, our current contract with you is to support um, your um, major business application through IE6 and we won't support IE7 or IE8, I think they were up to by that stage, um, unless you pay us a whole lot more money. So, so, the, you know, so there are a lot of things to take into account. So as things more, move more into the, the cloud, I think that's going to um, create more opportunities. Um, but the second one is, um, particularly in federal government, particularly for large tenders, um, a department can only choose from the tenders that are given to it. And if every single tender response comes back, um, and, and there is absolutely no you know, um, variety in the options that come back, then you can only choose from what you're given. Otherwise, you know, it's it's like you're. Otherwise, you're actually thwarting what is actually, a, you know, supposed to be a, a reasonable system. So, um, it's important to note that you know people actually need to put forward tender um, responses. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot more ways for SMEs, for small businesses, to actually engage with government to do contracting now than they were. So there's still a lot of perspective that it's too hard to work with government, but that's changed a lot just in the last few years. And um, so a lot of the industry needs to, you know, needs, needs to engage more with government and with the opportunities that are available to it. We now have a, in federal government an SME IT advocate, who, Don Easter, whose entire job is to look at how to make it easier um, for SMEs to actually get government business. So that's a whole new thing that's only a couple of years running and a lot of changes have been made to some of the rules and procurement stuff around to make that easier. So there's a couple of aspects there, but the other one is also just about that, that like you say, just collaborating and figuring out how to make it, um, how to find ways to solve a problem once rather than many, many, many times. Shared services is one of those terms that's become a dirty word because of you know a couple of states have had some pretty major issues that have been widely reported. Um, but there's other states and territories who have done it very, very, very well. And that's never reported because no one likes a feel-good story. Yeah. So um, getting more, I, guess, I think, um, balance in the reporting around um, what can and can't work, I think, is very important. Now, we had Jung. Yes? Um, so I'm not going to try and get anything up on the screen, but if you go on the LCA 2014 hashtag, I'm Angry Goat on Twitter, and there's an image there of... WA visualised by looting Landgate's WFS service to grab all of their sewer data. So for a reason I won't go into, I wanted the entire sewer network of Western Australia. <laughs> and Landgate only, um, Landgate have a WFS service, which is web feature service, um, I think, Keith's not wincing, um, which lets you grab um, polygon data, line data, in a fully, you know, almost like SVG. Um, rather than uh, rastered data. But they'll only give you 5,000 points at a time. So I wrote a little tool that you say, give me everything between this latitude and longitude and this latitude and longitude, which you know, in this case was WA, and it does a WFS request for those. And it knows what the feature limit is. So for 5, 000, if it gets 5,000 answers, it goes, aha, wrong. It divides that area up into four, puts it on the list, and asks for those four areas. And the image that you'll get off Twitter is um, a bunch of little, it's like a quad tree, uh, you know, a bunch of lines of rectangles. What's cool is it actually maps, the sewer network actually maps where the population in the state is. <laughs> because where you've gone in a lot is where people need sewer services. But um, yeah, that's the kind of thing you can do to be, you know, obnoxious to government departments that have feature limits <laughs> and still retain access to all of their data. <laughs> I can give you a question. Can you come up here? Yeah? Oh, no. No, no, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Give me a question. I'll give you. Okay. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of people here who are excited about open government data. Yeah. How, how do we get other people excited about it? Is there one killer app for a better term that we need? All right, so the question is, um, how do the um, enthusiastic people in this room get other people excited about it, and is there a killer app that we need? Oh, such a big question. So the first thing is um, um, doing cool stuff that you can show off, basically. One of the things I found really interesting is um, 
the, the progress of, uh, there's a, a growing, a very rapid growing interest in open data um, across so many spheres now of people who have traditionally never even spoken to each other. So we've got the um, data journalism taking off. I mean, at a time where one of the major media um, groups in Australia was firing hundreds of journalists or staff, it was then hiring data journalists, which is a very, very interesting little trend. Um, but we now, pretty much all the major media in Australia now have data journalists working on stuff, and that's, that's fascinating. What is a data journalist? Ooh, so a data journalist, <laughs> thank you for the good question. Um, a data journalist is a journalist who's focused on the, um, hopefully, on the analysis of, uh, seeking out of, data visualisation of, and, um, and reporting through the use of and presentation of data. So what's starting to happen is, um, rather than just the traditional, you know, story with maybe a couple of little facts thrown in there, hopefully, um, and a picture of someone with their baby, um, you're, you're starting to get um, a lot more journalism where they have um, either static or even interactive um, visualisation of data so people can start to play around with it and, and understand what it means more intuitively. Infographics. Infographics, yes. And it's been really handy because as a geek, as a technical person, I always thought of data visualisation as that wanky thing that you have to do for your manager because they can't be bothered reading your report. Um, <laughs> But it is actually useful, it is actually, if you start thinking about it from a perspective of you are trying to help someone who is time poor, who doesn't have the scope or interest or focus or, or you know, or, or time that you've had to research the thing that you've researched. Sorry? Oh, good. Well, in that case. you've got millions and millions of data points, you need some way for a human brain to... Yeah. Process those. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I need to repeat the thing. So yes, if you've got millions of data points, you need for a way for people to process it. And yeah, data visualization helps um, uh, not only communicate some very complex ideas in a very in a, in a much more efficient way, but it also when you start creating the interactive data visualizations, it gives people the ability to start experimenting with, playing with, and engaging with the information and the knowledge that's within the data that they may not otherwise do. Uh, so data journalism is 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 becoming a whole practice around using data to do better journalism, and, which is really cool. So we've got data journalists, we've got open science really starting to take off, and I mean we have a new policy, which I didn't mention before, at the federal level, which says that every, uh, all research data is supposed to be published publicly within six months of the papers being published. That's new. They've never focused on data publishing before. Uh, it's always been about the papers, and in fact, paper publishing has been used as an excuse to not publish the research data, because what if someone else took, takes my research data and does a paper before I do my paper? So, well, not me, but you know, someone. Um, so there's the, so research data and, and open science stuff happening. There's um, uh, a whole bunch of stuff happening from an industry perspective of startups picking up and using government data to do cool stuff. So there's the, most of the, the average people out there will probably not care about this space. But um, if you want to get more data from government and you want the, I guess, the ecosystem to grow, then showing it off, um, doing case studies, um, requesting data that you actually need and, um, and saying, you know, he, here's the data that we need and then after you've got it, showing what you can do with it that's really interesting and really cool. Um, and, you know, but fundamentally, um, uh, you know, just doing what you would do anyway, in a lot of ways, just doing it really well and really publicly. Does that make sense? Because yeah, sort of. we're not going to be able to get every single person out there excited about this stuff, but if you can say, well, here is a, uh, a website or an application or whatever to make it easier to do something. I'll, I'll give you um, an example. One of the federal government departments uh, wanted to do a app to make it easy for you to take the, um, uh, what's that called? The, the data about the efficiency, energy efficiency of every electrical device in Australia. So they collect that data on a daily basis, basically. And so they have the huge data set of all the electric, um, uh, energy efficiency. So they wanted an app so that someone could go into Bingley or whatever and say, I want to compare that TV to that TV and make a more informed choice based on energy efficiency, right? That's kind of cool. They, they were given a quote on how much it would cost to build an API to their existing system. They were given a quote on how much an app would cost. Rah, rah. Luckily, I'd already been talking to them. <laughs> and so 
um, they started um, publishing their data to data.gov.au, which automatically generated, so they publish it in good data format. Um, it automatically generates an API, which means they've just saved that 20K. Um, and then they developed their, API, uh, their application to do what they wanted to do, but because other people now have access to the data set and to the API, a whole bunch of other applications have since um, spun up as well. So the agency is super happy because they've saved money, delivered what they needed to deliver, um, but at the same time, a whole bunch of other people are now doing it as well and using their data. So that, and, and them seeing that is very, very handy and very useful and, and better deliver services and such. Yep. Sorry, you said the data was published? Data go by you. Data go. So, hold on. Whee! Here's one I prepared earlier. In fact, and it's updated on a daily basis. So it's updated on a daily basis, actually. So we worked with them to create an automation script so that it pulls the data out on a daily basis and pushes it up to data.gov.au on an automatic basis. So they've saved hours every day, or certainly every month, in updating and publishing what they wanted to publish anyway. Uh, you go to data sets. It's usually the top ones, but it's updated every day. Energy rating for household appliances. Um, which is kind of cool. I'll show you a couple of other ones as well. Oh, so slow. Okay, hold on. Networks. Oh, that's new. <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We actually published the last 10 years of all government contracts over $10,000 because they're all the ones that have to be reported on publicly. So we've just published the last like 10 years worth of that data or 12, 13 years of that data, which is kind of cool. Uh, anyway, so. So. There you go. That, yeah, and, um, and we've actually also got a leaderboard of all of the Twitter accounts as well, which gives the top, it, it basically gives a list of um, all of the government Twitter accounts and um, in order of how many followers they've got. And it's kind of fun because we publish that every month, so as in my team publish that every month as a way to sort of get a little bit of competition going with the agencies. Oh, and it's so funny to watch. Um, and it's good because... It, yeah, and it, but it's really good because not only does it get them sort of competing, but even though number of followers shouldn't be something you compete on. I mean, if I went and tweeted something superbly embarrassing, then that would get a lot of followers, but it's not necessarily the success criteria I want to be judged on, right? But it also gets them knowing who else is doing stuff, um, which means that they can start sharing experience sort of across agencies and start saying, oh, well, I've got this tricky problem. How do I deal with it? And rather than having to do it in isolation, they can work with other agencies to do it. So that's kind of cool. Um, okay. So, yeah. Lots of, so basically just do cool stuff is, is a simple answer. When I go to Treasury and say, um, so we've got one of the data requests uh, on, data gov on the data.gov.au data request site, which I'll show you. Again, here's one I prepared earlier. Data.gov.au. Uh, um, I can also say, by the way, people have screen scraped all the portfolio budget statements and have actually published not only the CSV, but um, an API and um, the, um, and, and how else, oh, and a data visualization of the federal budget, which by the way is wrong because of screen scraping means that some of the characters are out, which means that there's not, that is the data set everyone's using, but it's wrong. And so that's sort of incentive for them to open up the data. Um, so yeah, it's kind of cool. So we've got um, 41, data requests, we've got people voting up and voting down stuff, adding comments, and then um, we basically, um, every data set that hits I think five votes at this point, and we'll see how we go, uh, we then go and chase up with a relevant agency and then we uh, tell people where it's up to and then we sort of try to track it as a bit of a public um, and fairly transparent approach to um, engaging with community requests for data. It's really kind of fun. Okay, so let's go into the last session for today. Any other lightning talks, any other topics anyone wants to cover about this space? No. Oh, yes. Got Come. Question. Oh. <laughs> Damn you all and your questions. Yeah, I'll come down. Okay. So this, this comes up every year around uh, June, July for Australians and that's the perennial problem of filling in your tax return when ah. you don't have access to anything other than machines running Windows. And um, my frank assessment is that eventually we're going to be forced to find one because I can't see any movement uh, at the Australian government level of them supporting some form of HTML5 um, operating system independent way of lodging our Australian tax returns. And they are now, what I've noticed is that they've now started to move more and more of the 
really obscure corners of the tax return to electronic only lodgement. And so I think it's only a matter of time now before they do the same thing for the entire tax return. And so for people like myself, which do not own any machines other than those running Linux, um, it's going to leave us in a bit of a bind. I've got to do paper tax returns because I can't use TaxPack. So, you know, what can we do to try and circumvent this problem? Because, you know, you, you contact them every year and they basically say, we won't support that. <laughs> well, I won't do that. Well, the, the wine. The, it's not a solution. No. Well, the, the wine thing is interesting because um, there's. I mean, I, I looked into it again this year, and I found just as many people saying it bombed out on me as who said it actually worked for them. And there's a little interesting thing in the terms and conditions that basically say that you know, I think. The problem if you run it under wine, if something goes wrong, and as far as I can tell there's a fairly good chance that something's going to go wrong, you run it under wine, I'm not actually convinced that the um, protections that are afforded to you as a user of the tax pack software are actually going to be afforded to you if the software screws up your tax return. Mm. Because they'll just come back and say you're not running it on a supported system, therefore you're liable. It's a, I expect you'll find yourself in very murky legal territory if you try and pull that, and if something goes wrong. And as I said, I'm not comfortable with tax pack running under wine at the moment because a significant number of people in 2013 were reporting, oh, it's stuffed up here or it's stuffed up there, or even more worrying, it's stuffed up at the last final submit bit, and I don't know if it's actually submitted or not. And what do you do? So yeah, I mean, wine would be a workaround if you could rely on it, but the nature of wine and the nature of the ATO's application, plus this fact that you know this is a fairly important legal document that you're trying to submit, I'm not actually convinced that it's a safe way to proceed. That's extremely tedious, <laughs> and we shouldn't have to do it. Who wants to talk about this? Who wants to respond to this? Anyone? She's just done the walking for you. Yes. I okay. Everyone can hear me okay? Brilliant. Um, so just picking up on the legal argument, there's actually a concept under the 1974 Trade Practices Act, which I think was recently updated, called third-line forcing. The Australian government as a legal entity is essentially third-line forcing you to use another product to submit your tax return. This hasn't actually been tested under the Australian legal system, but it would be a very interesting legal argument to run. The Australian government requires you to use a specific product to um, lodge a tax return, which you're legally required to do. The third line forcing you to use a product. No one's actually tested this and I'd love someone to test it. So what's the um, what's the actual allowances of that act that you're referring to? Like is it um, like what are you challenge are you challenging the fact that they are forcing you to use a single product? The the Trade Practices Act. Yep. Um, the Trade Practices Act of 1974 has specific clauses about third line forcing. So um, the concept of third line forcing is if I want you to use product A and you have to use product A plus B to be able to use product A, you're essentially forcing a third line product onto the consumer. It's mm -hmm. protected under law. That's essentially what's happening here, but no one's actually tested well, it in so the courts. The Act is saying that that's not allowed, is that? That's correct. It's illegal <coughs> under the Trade Practices Act. Well, if anybody has a couple million dollars and you can challenge it in the High Court, go for it. <laughs> It's just a quick comment um, and just to show that there is hope. Um, back in Brazil, they are already supporting multiple operating systems. Uh, it's unfortunately a Java-based application, not a modern web application yet. Uh, but you can do your tax return on Linux, Mac, and Windows if you wish That's to. Right. That's what yeah. we need here. So. <laughs> um, There's one over there too. Could this come into the open data thing? If, if am I not? <laughs> ah. um, instead of coming up with an application for Linux and Mac and blah 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 blah, they release the form data in a better format so someone else can come along with the. Yeah. 
should totes put it up there on the public ideas, yeah. I guess, I guess the potential issue there is I, I can imagine the government's going to say, oh, privacy, we can't do that, you know, tax return stuff is sensitive. And no, 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 that, no, but, but government, but, but this is where we get it. So one of the things that I, I'm being recorded, aren't I? <laughs> I, I was a little cheeky to put up here as well, but um, the data request site, you might notice it says government data sets or APIs. Yep. So request it as an API. And then uh, if enough people vote for it, uh, then we can then go to the ATO as the data governor you. So I've got my data governor you hat on right now, um, and say um, so. This API has been requested. Is there any way to fulfil this um, and uh, and see what happens? So I'll come back to that in a second though. Sure. Who else had a comment? <laughs> Well, you can go and make yeah. your request right now. Yeah, you've got to active Open e-tax, that works. Five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> How many are in the room? From Australia. So everyone here votes. From Australia. Yeah. I'm just thinking a hack you could do. You could fire up an Amazon micro instance running Windows Server <laughs> and just run it on there. I mean, it wouldn't cost you anything. True. A lot more hassle than it's worth, though, really. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey, um, is this working? Yes. Um, just to um, possibly give hope, there's actually is already um, an API for submitting your tax return to the ATO and pretty much every major G20 tax authority in the world except only if you're a business. It's called XBRL and it's an XML based uh, insane uh, system, but there's there's an extant you know API out there for posting, submitting you know computer uh, machine readable open standards for submitting tax returns. So hopefully theoretically um, they can read across and use that in a different environment as well. Yeah, I mean the problem with an obscenely nasty API is that no one will bother to try and use it. But yeah, I mean, that's good. That sounds like it's a good plan. Although the other thing too is, and I guess we've got to wrap up to it at some point, um, the other thing that I, having talked to a couple of people in government and all that, it does seem to me that if there's a priority for shifting these sorts of things so that, you know, to open it up, make it easier for people, there seems to be a greater um, preference for the government to concentrate on the business side and just let the personal side just sort of languish without a lot of attention, which may actually explain why that API exists, but only for business. Because I've seen that crop up a, f a couple of times where, yeah, business can do it this way, but if you don't have an ABN, then you can't and you've got to do it this way. And usually the alternative way is a right royal pain in the neck. So I'll ask the same question next year. And I'll try to put comments in as well. So, um, so there's a couple of things there. There's the retrospective dealing with systems that already exist that um, are limited in, in how they support different users and, um, and different operating systems. And um, uh, I actually know a lot about that particular example that I can't talk about. <laughs> um, but um, it's worth asking the question why. A lot of people immediately assume that the government are a little bit nefarious or a little or you know or trying to be exclusive or trying to force a particular product or whatever but in a lot of cases that that's not that's not entirely the case and um, so and and it comes back to ensuring that and this is why again I got involved in procurement stuff um, understanding um, the ramifications of procurement of systems for government is really, really important. So is the standard that's been developed for the implementation of a product um, able to be reused? Does it fit into the existing contract? Will it cost extra money? Well, how much money will it cost? La, la, la. Um, so there, there's, there's uh, understanding why this is the case, I think is probably a very important thing to investigate and, and asking the ATO, look, not, not just saying we want it, we want it now, because we've all been saying that for many years now, but saying why is this the case? You know, what are actually the blockers to doing this? Um, and why does it, why is it so prohibitively, you know, if you're saying it's prohibitive to cost, um, a prohibitive cost to support other operating systems, including Linux, then w what are you basing that on and can we help you with trying to figure out, you know, we would happily develop the solution for you if you gave us the, you know, system APIs, if you gave us, you know, the, the standard, if you get, you know, all those kind of things. So, um, you know, we're a technical community, we can scratch our own itch, you just need to give us the, the information, understands how to do stuff. So that's the number, that's the first thing is, is retrospective is always going to be tricky. 
But I think it's worth noting that proactively, um, the new EU government policy talks about digitising um, government transactions that happen more than 50,000 times a year. So using that as a case study to say, this is why it's so important to have a standards-based approach that is um, compliant, you know, that is HTML5 uh, you know, approach that um, rather than having an iPhone app, having a uh, responsive web approach that will um, that is inclusive rather than exclusive in terms of who it delivers services to and how those services are delivered. Uh, the government has an API account, all those kinds of things. So, so approaching government not just from a, we're really cranky about this, but rather the lessons learnt from this should help make future um, services more efficient, more effective, more inclusive um, and save you money is a, is a good way to put it. So just as a, as a suggestion. Um, someone once gave me the advice and it's been very sage advice. Um, the, the best way you can change things in government is to offer a solution. If you can say, this is a problem because of X, Y, and Z, and here's how you can fix it, then that's going to be a lot more, uh, a lot better a way to getting it changed than um, you know um, pointing out the issues. Um, okay, so let's go into this last session. So the idea.